Hi everyone, I'm Steve Lochran. Um, some of you may have caught me the talk I gave this morning. That was the shallow and entertaining one. I noticed the one that is intellectually challenging has a lower turnout. So I'd like to say I appreciate all of those people. So this talk is about Vector.io. This is me, Steve. I work at Cloudera. I've actually been working on open source stuff since 2000, 2001 on build things, soap stacks, that kind of stuff. Hadoop since 20, 2009. And I've ended up doing Hadoop in cloud stuff, particularly the cloud connectors are where I, I deal with. I estimate some number of petabytes of data go through my code every day. That's kind of a rough guess. I do know that when that data doesn't get through or when it gets slow, me and my colleagues get called. Um, when I'm not doing that, I like to do hobbies that are out of phone coverage. So one recurrent problem, my data is too slow to read. That's a tricky one. And a fundamental one is because reading from cloud storage is slow. It's a long way away, and we're using HTTP requests to get it. It's not a file system. And there is the latency of the request. There is the fact that we are setting up HTTPS connections, which take time to, time to actually negotiate. Once you've got that connection, you're waiting for the mysteries of TCP flow control to actually give you full full data rate. And so creating and destroying HTTP connections is really, really expensive. We try to cache and recycle, but it's not always great. And as a result, things are slow. People's machines have to stay around waiting for answers to happen, to, you know, to complete. People sit around getting bored, or they say, we are going to spend more money building bigger clusters. Uh, that gives you a bigger bill for whoever of the three you're running on. Some of the worst case situations is when it takes so long, say you're generating, you're doing an ingress of an hour's worth of data. Every hour you're updating it. If it takes too long to read, process, and commit the updates, you're starting to get very, you've got to be doing it in that hour before the next data comes in. So there are certain critical thresholds. So we have to make things faster. One of the interesting things, or good things, is that all the data almost all the data that is stored in big production clusters is one of generally essentially one of two formats, ORC and so Apache, Apache Orc and Apache Parquet. Now, is there anyone in the audience who has a committer in Apache Orc? <laughs> Owen. Is there anyone who does the same in Apache Parquet? Is anyone here? Yeah, okay, great. We've got turn up there too. That's good. Um, anyone here using CSV files in production? Okay, you get to leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you can keep going. I would say I don't care about your problems, but I did one of the support calls I hit last year was um, inconsistent row counts processing 14 gigabyte CSV files in Azure. That was fun. Anyway. So how do we read data? All these libraries, they use the, the POSIX APIs through the Java code that basically says, read this much data at an offset, which then gets passed down to the OS as a seek followed by a read. That's the API since it was written for PDP 11 in the 70s or whatever. And seek was a concept. Your hard disk reader, it would actually just move. It had to seek, and then it would read. And so you could only read one. One, bit, you know, one block of data at a time. And the API manifests that. But that was a long, long time ago. Now, laptops, a lot of the fast clusters, we're all using SSDs. Bandwidth is fantastic. There is no seeking anymore. There, you know, the, so the challenge there is just kicking off the DMA controllers and getting them to do their thing and then waiting for the answers. For cloud, the problem is that latency. And the challenge there is, how do, how do we hide that latency? Um, key concept here, and a key part of it, is that that API where you seek and read, you're not telling the underlying operating system, the file system clients, what you're going to do next. All it knows is, I want to read it 20 megabytes in this file. And then it goes, right, now, once that's finished, OK, now go and seek 200 megabytes, and then read 10 megabytes in there. 
So it's called random I.O., but really the applications, or more specifically the, the, the libraries to read OSC and Parky files, they know what they're doing. It's just there is no way to tell, tell, tell the layers in between. So it's not really random at all. If we look at the two formats, they're both column of representations of data. They're optimized for saying we can read specific columns of massive gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte tables by first working out which of the files to read, opening those files, looking at a footer at the bottom to see, are you really one of those files? Read the real footer to say, right, where does the data live? And then data is stored as columns for, for each particular, you know, for each row, you basically have column, set, column one, column two, column three, done sequentially. At the end of each row, for a reason that's historical, that's where summary data gets written in OSC files. It basically says, here's the min, here is the max, that kind of stuff. When you're doing a read, whether it's a SQL select, whether it's a lump of a piece of Python or whatever, the information about what, re you know, what columns you want to read is absolutely used to choose the columns. And anything filtering you can do, like ranges, you know, min and max and that, that's where we can actually just read those footers and then decide whether to re read the real columns. So processing a ORC file then, you read the footer, you, re you work out where the stripes are, you read the footers of the stripes if you, if you can do the right thing, and then if you need to, you go and read the row data in. Parquet is pretty much the same, slightly more complicated, I think, in different ways. And if you're curious, it uses Facebook's thrift format for the actual format. But same thing. There is a magic number at the bottom. Then at the footer, you've got the schemas where the columns are stored. And again, you can do, once you've actually read that footer to work out where the stripes are going to be, you can actually do selective reading of only those stripes you need. The way it's processed then is your query engine, it, each of different worker threads knows the files it's got to process or the bits of the files it's got to process. Currently, it sequentially goes to that data. It reads in a bit, it basically reads in that footer and then has to go through each of those stripes it reads success sequentially and it has to wait for those reads to finish before it can do the next bit of work. That's Inefficient on local storage, it's absolutely atrocious in cloud. So what we need to do then is saying, well, how do we support columnar data storage better? How do we provide a file system API that is ideal for reading columns? And the good news is we do not have to invent it. We just have a look and say, what did Linus do? And that's why in Linux, you basically have vectored read APIs. And way back when Sun owned Java, they said, hey, let's do the same thing. And there is a Java API to do native I.O. So what we have then is an equivalent of that through the Hadoop file system APIs, which is used by the, 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 big, Java, big, the Java big data stack from Apache in all its forms. And we say, right, the caller can say, here is a range of data I want you to read. I want the answers to come back asynchronously, if you feel like it. I want the answers to come back in whatever order you, come back, you feel like it. And you can do whatever you want to optimize this. The goal here, then, is we have an API that works as well as the current single sequential ranged reads is the worst case. And the best case is significantly optimized for the underlying store. All we've done here is we've added a new API call, a new method to the Hadoop positioned readable interface that lets you specify, I want to read at this offset, this, this match data, stick into this buffer. Now you say, I am going to provide a list of file, file ranges and a function which provides the buffers where you're going to write it, the factory, the memory allocator. We have a default implementation, so every class, every library, even the third-party libraries like Google's, <coughs> which implements this API, 
they automatically get this new method in if they're on an implementation of the Hadoop runtime, Hadoop common, that, is in, that, that has this API call. What does it bring to the table? It can be asynchronous. If your underlying stores can be fetching data in parallel, it will do that. And they can return in whatever order the underlying stores choose to read it. So if we're talking to an object store, we give three ranges. If we're doing three parallel HTTP requests, then the shorter one might come back first, or it gets to a load balance, so the data is closer. That you know, even if it's a bigger amount, bigger, um, larger amount of data, that may come back first instead. And your application, all you have to do is just you, you get the responses. You you wait for them data to come in, and you can process as it comes in. This is exactly what ORC and Parquet can can make advantage of. It also gives us great opportunities to boost performance. Now, how has it been implemented? So far, Hadoop 335, we have two implementations. We have one, well, actually three. The default one says we fall back to existing API. We just do sequential, seek, read, seek, read, seek, read. So it is never any worse than what you have today. You don't think, oh, no. This is going to be a downgrade if I switch to it. If it's there, do it. It will work as well as you've got today. For the local API, that is the one you get when you're running Spark standalone on your own laptop, as an example. We use the Java native APIs, and it is you gain all the, all the benefits that has been done in operating systems in the last, at least, in, at least since SSDs were invented. So that's like 20 years worth of improvement in data retrieval. On the S3A connector, to talk to Amazon S3, we have put a lot of effort into parallelizing the access. Request comes in from whatever your application is. It goes to enhanced Parquet Orc libraries. They pass in the ranges. We take the ranges. We basically look on the offsets. We sort them. We make a decision about whether we should do them in separate requests or should we coalesce them, like how much data we're going to discard between them. Then for each combined range, we just kick off a parallel GET request. When they come in, they come in. If we've coalesced things as a bit in the middle, we throw away. We have a dream, an unrealized dream, that someone in the Amazon S3 team will go and back and, re and read the HTTP specification in a bit more detail and notice that you don't just do a GET request, you have a single content range of start to finish, but you can provide a comma-separated sequence of them, the one place where CSVs would be useful. And then you can actually do single requests where you don't have to worry about that bit in between. And that would really improve bandwidth and things as well. So the other thing in the S3A stuff is we do these reads in parallel. We have a little thread pool which is shared across the entire file system. We limit each of the individual threads to a smaller number. It's default to four. We set it reasonably low default to defend ourselves against the, the benchmark team that will generally create a massive number and then say, this is really fast. And you go into production, you find out you can't use it at that scale when you're generating so much I.O. that S3 starts to throttle. So we dream of multiple GET requests. How do you use it? It is nice and straightforward. This is the classic Hadoop API in Java. I write at the top, I basically say, I have my path where I'm going to be reading the file from. I create a matching file system client to do it. If it's a S3A URL, you get S3A connector. If it's a file URL, you get the local FS connectors. Then you just build a range of addresses. A file range is just a type that has Start point, where you want to read from, where how much data you want to read, and a completely opaque reference to an object where you put whatever you want in. And you need a memory allocator so that we can allocate memory as we go along. The reason for that is it stops your application having to pre-allocate all the memory you need in advance. You can send multiple ranges in, and we can, we can recycle buffers, if that helps. Then. You open the file. You just do FS open like you did normally. Whereas now, when you're reading the data, you just hand in that range you've got, read vectors, give the ranges and an allocator, and wait for it to answer. 
what we're doing here then is we get the list of ranges we've got for each one of them. We throw it into the thread pool we've allocated to process it. And we pretty much process it. Here we're returning the buffer back into the pool. And we have a countdown to say which this bit of code can say I block until it's all ready. If we are doing something more complicated, and because it's coming in random order, you need to work out which particular piece of my own code does a response come from. That's what the opaque reference is for. You can grab that, extract it, cast it to whatever data type, class, Java class, Scala class you want, and, and, and work on it. And that's how we tend to do our callbacks, is you grab the, uh, grab the reference, cast it, and process. Now, if you are doing, if from the default implementation, you will only actually get one of these responses at a time. Once it's finished, it'll go away and do the next one. But you can still be processing it asynchronously, maybe. When we're running in parallel on any of the connectors that does parallel I.O., then your thread pool will be kept busy. Does it actually make things faster? Oh, yes, it does. Um, Where we validated this, first we just did some benchmarks using the Java Microbench framework just against local file system stuff where we're getting about a 7x speed up just, just reading file, you know, nothing fancy, just because we've got an SSD optimized API. When we're running with ORC S3, we are in that world of benchmarks, which is always a bit kind of varied. We are seeing some really good speed ups too, the kind of speed ups that are actually significant enough to say, if you can do this, you should do it. So Java Micro Benchmark, we compare new API, classic API, so the classic C can read, the new API, and direct Java native I.O. APIs without any of the Hadoop bits interfering at all. Kick them off to do validation. This code exists in the Hadoop library, so you can compare it with your own stuff. The key thing was the classic synchronous read at the top to do whatever reads it was doing. Um, it was taking 12,000 microseconds per operation, like per byte or block or something like that. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember the code. I could find it. Um, whereas the raw native thing, um, the async file channel array is taking 705 millis, which is a significant difference. We get down to the checksum file system in Hadoop now. We're taking... 900 millis, which is a lot closer to the 700 milliseconds. And if you're wondering what's happening between, the checksum FS, after reading each block, it validates that that data has not been tainted, that it's still valid, so that even if something's gone horribly wrong with your SSDs, this thing will blow up saying your data is not good. If you really want to try hard, you can turn that off and say, I want a raw FS, and then you're down to 800. So we are getting very, very, very good improvements compared to that original stuff. That's your local FS. I'd say if you're just doing work on your laptop without going anywhere near the object stores, this is justified. Now, what about processing orc data in Amazon S3? This is where my former colleague, who is now a working full-time back on object storage, now he's left LinkedIn, um, helped <coughs> both with the design of the API and the orc implementation. Once you modify the ORC library to use this API, all applications calling the existing ORC library, they get the speed up. You don't need to make any changes in your client code. You don't need to make any changes in Hive. It, it just, it's just faster. And I am nicely informed that ORC trunk is now building with a Hadoop version that has this in as default, so they may be able to switch more easily. So, in a TPCH benchmark, we're seeing a 10 to 20% decrease in query runtimes. So this is a query over 300 gigabytes worth of data. If you run and comparing the graphs like this, you look at the performance improvements. And apart from some really, really weird one that's apparently very small, everything gets faster. Roughly, you know, about 10% or maybe less bit or more, but it's, it's kind of consistent. So apart from that tiny one, it doesn't get any worse. Everything gets better. Now, a full TCPDS benchmark, same scale, lots and lots of tests. This is all done in Amazon EC2, by the way. We have to run 
quite a few times, because it's always a bit inconsistent depending on your neighbors. So any of these test results from us or anyone else that's running in cloud, you should really make sure that you get the results from one single test run, not the best for each query across every test run for a, a realism. Again, we get some pretty good numbers all around. I don't know where I get those two blips there. Uh, Rajesh, who did the test, said that really high one is it's an incredibly short query, so it doesn't really matter. If we look back, it's a tiny, one of the tiny ones around here. So the fact that it's got significantly slow, it's that one. It's not really, his belief is it shouldn't be tangible. Uh, so this, I think says it shouldn't be tangible apart from those people that depend on it in real time answers. Anyway, it was a very small thing, and just allocating, releasing containers did it. The final benchmark was testing where we looked at the ETL problem of we're trying to grab in dumb strings, process them, go into a pipeline of actually getting something in that you can start querying off better. It was written in Hive by, by people that kind of do work in this area. So even though it's synthetic, it's not completely manufactured to make these things look good. However, it does make things look good. Uh, I'll point out if it, things made, made if it had not made things look good, you would not be seeing this slide right now. So just, just, just bear that in mind as a disclaimer, OK? I w don't ask me about the 17 other benchmarks that don't exist, as an example. Um, anyway, so again, that one showed phenomenal speed ups. I have no idea why, but apparently it's because, well, we're, we're just doing range requests. I, I, I don't know what actually that people doing the benchmark did in terms of tuning some of the parallelism either, OK? But everyone is happy. And the bigger the data you're going through, the better it gets. It scales nicely. It's not like really fast for small data sets, but really large production ones. It suffers. It seems to suffer. It seems to work really nicely. And it is shipping. So if you go to patch.org, you download the latest build, 335, then you get this API. And if you, and we're doing, we're going to release a 336 now, and there are no bug fixes to this code yet, which is nice. We haven't found a problem yet. Um, you get that local file system implementation. We get the S3A one. If you don't have that, everything else works. Um, we do not yet have anything related to Azure ABFS yet for the same speed up, which is a shame. If there is anybody that works in this area, wants to get, is running code in this area, wants to get it faster, this would be a really good way to deal with it. ABFS does some prefetching, does some asynchronous prefetching. That works. That delivers some speed up, but only if you really are reading sequential code like OSC and Avro. I am very, very confident that this, the, the current ABFS code doesn't deliver significant speed ups for uh, or Parquet data, because if it was, all our, all our testing internally would have found the we accidentally get prefetching pre wrong bug. GCS, that's not in the Hadoop code base itself. It's maintained by Google. We do talk to them. And they. They have a bit of optimization in there for reading parquet data, which is they, they grab and cache that footer. But then everything else, it is just done through more, more single, single range get requests. We could do the same thing here. I believe they do support multiple ranges in a single get. So another juicy target. Hopefully, we get down to implement that while Google is still providing Google Cloud as a service. Now the bad news. Yes, it's in the Hadoop code. Yes, you can download it from Apache.org. Yes, you can point your Maven Gradle builds at it. But you do not get that speed up out the box with the official Apache libraries. And the problem with that is they have historically been stuck in time where they are constrained to support very large, very outdated Hadoop clusters running um, custom forks of Hadoop 2 at some vast scale at LinkedIn over there, and things like that. And it, the problem is, is that the cost of upgrading is a nightmare. The people doing these format libraries don't want to break the bad news that they have. The, the, somebody at LinkedIn has to upgrade their entire clusters just to get the latest release. So 
we have to deal with this fact. Um, as well as ORC and Parquet libraries, Apache Iceberg, they take slightly older releases of the Parquet uh, library and then bundle it in their own binaries. So there's even an extra bit of lag there. Now, in Cloudera, we can fix this problem internally because with a bit of kind of kicking, we do actually have a unified build of everything. So we can and have forked the, we have forks of LLC Parquet libraries where this patch is in. Um, I could say that's enough. I don't have to care about the rest of the world, but that's not nice for the rest of the world. It's also the less we diverge from the open source, the better our life is. It keeps our maintenance costs down. It means if there's any bug found, it keeps our costs down. And it means it's easier to push more changes back. You start forking once, you end up being more and more diverged, and maintenance just gets worse over time. So we want to get this stuff back. One of the things I am doing right now is we started work on a shim library, Hadoop API shim, which supports all the old Hadoop 3.1 plus or 3.2 plus versions, um, builds against it. When this API is there, when some other APIs are there, it will then forward to the new APIs unless you turn it off. Even in those production systems, you can say, I do not want this. And that's part of the aggression testing. The li this library is not that big. Most of the work is actually going, we actually want to run regression testing against every single version that we claim to support. I've got that working for local FileFS. I want to actually do it for testing through S3A as well. Until then, until that wonderful time that they have the updates, there are the JIRAs up there, Orc 1251, Parquet 2171. Do, um, do grab them. In fact, last week, I think I might have stuck it on the list, but I actually have modified the original Parquet 1 written by Mukund that directly called the APIs to use the shim library. It only took a morning, and most of that morning was spent trying to get a version of Apache Thrift compiler that worked on MacBook. So my happy conclusion. Vector.io radically transforms reading data through ORC and Parquet, especially in object stores, but even on your own laptops. Uh, it is shipping in Apache Hadoop. It has great speed up on S3. We still need to deal with Azure and GCS. It's absolutely critical that we get this into the Apache releases of the libraries so that those people that aren't prepared to fork and maintain their code actually get the benefits. And yeah, if anybody wants to play with this, it would be good. Now, that is pretty much the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Owen. Is Cloudera planning on working on the HDFS implementation of the vectored read? Do I have a slide on that? I have a set of slides ready for that. I forgot to actually add the no slide for Owen, actually. Um, no, I don't, yeah. No. All right. Um, the problem is, is that I think most of the work is going into Ozone. It would be a better target there. OK, that's your answer. It's there. You have the ability to write it. So yeah. go ahead, OK? No, agreed. I have a relationship with HGFS, which is I don't go near it out of fear of breaking it, <laughs> and the HGFS team are happy, OK? Um, Ozone makes a better target other than there are still a lot more users on HDFS than Ozone. Makes it lower risk to play, OK? And the point is, is that the absolute performance against the object stores is so much it's more tangible. Absolutely. And you have to bear in mind, actually, that HGFS legacy HDFS clusters that are still using actually spinning hard disks, they don't gain the same benefits. Okay, if you've gone over to SSD everywhere, if you have you, that would be kind of interesting to know. No. no. HDFS yeah. is still spinning disk. I, I mean, yeah. people keep wanting to put it onto to SSD, but the cost benefit isn't there. It's yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. HDFS is absolutely fantastic for low cost storage of data at massive scale, cheaper than the object stores once you've got enough. It gives huge, huge throughput. But to get that cost down, you want big, big spinning disks still. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, on the plus side, I act 
now that my vacation is over, uh, I fully intend to get this patch put into Orc. So. Get it into Orc, then you can start worrying about HDFS. You probably, well, you, you've been doing enough in HDFS, too, you can do actually. it. And now you don't have any meetings in your life. Exactly. You have the time to play. <laughs> Owen left LinkedIn recently to spend more time with his compiler. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone? Anyone out there? Anyone from the Parquet team wish to explain, state their plans for support of this? No. OK. Yeah. Well, I think we're done then. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you in the next talk.